Tonight. Our main text will be found in the book of Psalms, chapter 15. We are going to go to 2 Peter chapter 1 as well. We will not elaborate there, we'll just parallel a truth. So Psalms chapter number 15 tonight in your Bible. And we're looking forward to a new sermon series we're going to start on Sunday morning. You'll be praying about that. We're going to do a little series on the book of Jonah. So be praying about that and then Sunday evening. We're going to the ladies singing tonight and we'll get right to the preaching as soon as they finish. God's grace is sufficient for me, for me. God's grace is sufficient for me. When it seems all hope is gone, he is high upon his throne, working out the plan he started in me. Even when the way is dark and I can't see very far, even bright and shining light will be. I will worship him from pain and give glory to his name, for his grace is sufficient for me. God's grace was sufficient for Elijah as he was standing there on the mount. All the prophets of Baal, they began to scream and yell, and their God did a sound. Then Elijah prayed in faith like he knew that he should do, and the fire of the Lord did fall. It consumed the sacrifice with a single flash of light, and its power was seen by all. God's grace is sufficient for me, for me. God's grace is sufficient for me. When it seems all hope is gone, he is high upon his throne, working out the plan he started in me. Even when the way is dark and I can't see very Bright and shining light will be. I will worship and proclaim and give glory to His name, for His grace is sufficient for me. God's grace was sufficient for a Jonah as he was sitting in the belly of the whale. Oh, Jonah should have died, but the Lord kept him alive so that he would have a story he could tell. Well, then Jonah prayed in faith like he knew that he should do, and the fish came and swam into the shore. Well, he spit on Jonah. for me. When it seems all hope is gone, he is high upon his throne, working out the plan he started in me. Even when the way is dark and I can't see very far, he the bright and shining light will be. I will worship and proclaim and give glory to his name, for his grace is sufficient for me. I will worship and proclaim and give glory to his name, for his grace is sufficient for God's grace is sufficient. All right, thank you. Psalms chapter, <clears throat> once again, chapter 15. And we will just glance at here in a moment, 2 Peter chapter number 1. <clears throat> what I want to speak to you tonight about is securing your fellowship with the Lord. Now, on God's side, that's very simple. But it's not so simple sometimes on our side. Because we have a dual nature and we carry about with us the imperfections of that nature, that carnal nature, sometimes we interfere with our fellowship with God. And we can lose fellowship, and we don't want to lose fellowship with the Lord. We know that our fellowship is with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, as John said. Also, maybe we can... Uh, kind of think about this particular thought. How to stay still with God. And maybe think on this thought. That where you're at tonight, whether you're 10 or 20 or 60, that you're in that same area but matured and 40 years from now. Staying with what's right. Staying in fellowship or staying still with God. Securing fellowship. Now, we're going to be looking in the Old Testament, but once again, I do want us to see how this reflects to the New Testament. Psalms chapter 15, we'll read the entire psalm. It's only five verses. It is a psalm of David. Lord, now he asked a question. Who shall abide in thy tabernacle, or who shall dwell in thy holy hill? So there's the question. Now, the tabernacle, we understand that's no doubt where in the Old Testament they would have worshipped the Lord. 
God's presence would have been in the holiest of holies, and they would have ministered throughout each day at this particular tabernacle, and there was a place for that tabernacle to be built at or in reference to that holy hill. So this is the place where God's covenant people would meet God at for direction, for forgiveness, redemption, and just anything that they were obsolete of in their life as sinners and they needed in their saint walk. So the question, who shall abide in thy tabernacle and who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Now we're really looking at a promise. Let's look. He that worketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned. But he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. Now it's note verse 5. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. Now watch. He that doeth these things, watch the promise, it's a conditional thought here, the psalmist is saying, he that doeth these things shall never be what? Moved. Moved. Now, what draws a parallel to your mind about this? Well, Peter, Peter, remember when he spoke of, <clears throat> with his second letter, in chapter number one, I'll read it to you. <clears throat> He says, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Now, these are uh, principles of spiritual maturity, but there's also a promise here about the development of these, and it parallels what the psalmist was saying. Look at verse 8, for if these things be in you, and abound they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our lord jesus christ but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins wherefore the rather note the audience brethren save people give diligence to make your calling and election sure for if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Now that word fall, which is found in First Peter, or excuse me, Second Peter chapter one, verse ten, is closely associated with the word found in the book of Psalms, chapter fifteen, verse five, moved, moved. So our thought tonight is securing fellowship with the Lord, or how to stay still with God in your Christian walk. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven. We are surely thankful for your holy and blessed word. We pray tonight that your word would express to our hearts its sanctifying power and that you would encourage our lives forevermore. Thank you for what we've just read. We pray that the Holy Spirit will encourage us with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we've all heard the terms, and it happens. So we're not trying to minimize any particular person, but we've all heard the term backsliding or backslider. Well, obviously the word, if you can just picture it in your mind, it has the idea of someone that's moving forward, which has got the idea of maturity and growth, but all of a sudden something has stopped. And because of that something that's made them stop, the maturity and the growth has stopped and they are going backwards. Now, as Christians, we only got one way to go. We go back to our, our old nature. So when we backslide, we're backsliding into uh, something that's not good in any way, shape, or form. So we've heard that word. Now, the word is really used a lot with the nation of Israel. And we're not getting down on Israel. It's not our goal here tonight. But I want everybody here to know tonight that it's very possible that all of us can backslide. And you don't have to be a mile away from God to be backslidden. You can be that far away from God and be backslidden. So it's not, well, he really did it this time and he's really way out there. Um, that's, that, I understand that. But the fact of the matter is, uh, distance is not what makes 
backsliding, backsliding. There's, there's more to it than that. There's more to it. Matter of fact, somebody can be in church, I suppose, on a regular basis and, um, uh, you know, have a position in a local New Testament church, but yet, uh, you know, throughout the week, not maturing that particular ministry, uh, not studying or reading or growing in grace. And to, to, a, to a part there, there's some backslidingness there. But the nation of Israel, I just quote to you some some verses here. Now this is the prophet Isaiah, who was called to try to encourage the wayward people, but so much the more to rec- do to reveal the Messiah, Christ. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. Now this is a definition of backsliding or a backslider. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel in anger. They are gone away backward. Backward. So that's a good definition for backsliding. Not only did Isaiah mention this, which had a wonderful responsibility unto the Lord on behalf of the Lord for the people of God, but so did Jeremiah. And he was another prophet that was in line with the great prophecy given, such as Isaiah. And he says in chapter 7, in verse number 24, now these are both in reference to the nation of Israel, but it does apply to us as well. We'll see that in a moment. But they hearken not. Now this is Jeremiah referring to Israel in a relationship with God. But they hearken not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and the imagination of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. So we could say, we could say a couple things about backsliding. We could say that backsliding is doing evil. We could say that it's doing corrupt things. We could say that it's someone who's forsaken the Lord. And we could say that it's someone who has provoked the Lord to anger. And to provoke somebody to anger, there's obvious a reflection of that. Okay, when somebody's angry with you, they express that sometimes with just a look, sometimes with words, sometimes actions. Jeremiah, as we think about the definition of a backslider, He says that it would be people who hearken not unto the Lord. They're listening, but they're not listening unto the Lord. They hearken not, nor incline their ears, nor are they interested in what the Lord has to say, but walked in their counsel, so they would reject the counsel of God, and they would walk in the counsel of the ungodly, as the psalmist says as he started. And in the imagination of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward. Both, def- both, both scriptures give us the idea that a backslider is one who goes backwards. Goes backwards. Now as a Christian, you must, and you do, you must understand there's nothing good for you in the back. There's nothing good for you in your past life. You have nothing good there. You need to know that. There is nothing good in your past life. You've been redeemed and saved out of that for a cause. Another term that is used is drawing back. Drawing back. Now, drawing back, it's, it's, it's as a process. It's, as, it's not just a complete quick cutoff, but it's, it's just a slow thing that happens. You know, you, you quit reading your Bible maybe on a daily schedule or maybe your time with the Lord. You start to get uh, lazy on. I'm not sure how to actually put that because there's a lot of applications, maybe your schedule's busy, or your prayer life, you just, you know, it's not much, and this, and this happens a little bit here, and maybe you straighten that up a little bit, then it happens again here, and maybe you straighten that up a little bit, and, and then you do it again, and before you know it, there, these collective times start to form a little bit of a habit, and before you know it, you're just not even ministering, and you want to look to say, well, this is why I'm not ministering, because of this, well, what's that mean? It basically means you're, you could be trying to cover up backsliding by another situation. It could mean that, but drawing back, it's got the idea of slowly going back. And, and, and let me just say this. We don't read our Bible every day and pray every day and come to church and soul win. We don't do these things because we got to. We do these things because we love to. We love to do these things. These, these things are what we believe in. And we love them so much that we're very careful about not practicing them. I said we're very careful. Now, 
getting back to the thought of drawing back. Paul, I believe, was the author of the book of Hebrews, and he mentions drawing back. And I do believe that when he was writing the book of Hebrews, that there was that crowd he was addressing. But in the great inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he, he is in a very loving way just saying, we are not of that crowd that draw back. Or he says, I quote, chapter 10, verse 38. But now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now, somebody that was addressing, so no, there's no doubt when this epistle would have been read, somebody's gears could have started turning a little bit. And, and then to, to turn them gears more, he would have encouraged them on who they were by saying, but we are not of such. We are not of such, or as he says, we are not of them who draw back into perdition. And that's what we got to look forward to when we go backwards. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So that's another word that's used. Uh, denying the Lord is another word that's used, and that can be done in a lot of ways. And once again, not to get down on anybody, but uh, Peter, you know, he, um, he had some insecurity there for a little bit. I tell you, he did. Good man, too, by the way, but much better man than I am. And he had some insecurity there a little bit and says, I don't know who he is. I don't know the man. I do not know him. And then went back to his general employment when he should have been fishing for men as he was commissioned three, three and a half years earlier. And once again, we're talking about a great man here. We're not talking, we're, we're talking about someone who our creator chose to write two books in the Bible and preach some of the greatest messages this world's ever heard. And he denied the Lord. He backslid there a little bit. And so denying the Lord will be a type of backsliding. Satan's temptation. Satan is constantly tempting us to backslide. It was not this the case with Job? Did not and was not there a day when the sons of God presented themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them? And they got into the conversation and the conversation came up about Job. Do you see he's a righteous man? He's an upright man. He's a good man. And the enemy says he's good because you won't you won't let me get in on him the way that I know I need to get in on a man. If I can get in on him, he'll backslide. He'll deny you. And Job, we know, was tried with several different things, with the loss of children, with the loss of finances, with the loss of a testimony, it would seem, with his three friends that came to visit with him, with the loss of his health, and it just got bad, didn't it? But you know, he held his integrity, didn't he? He held his integrity. He's a good example for us. And Satan tries to tempt you and I to get us to go backwards. And we're going to look at this word move here in a moment, or fall. And then we think about forsaking the Lord. I said that was another definition. Well, Paul the Apostle, in one particular place of his epistle, he said, Demeth, and he mentions his laboring, ministering partners, saluteth you. Then at another time in one of his epistles, he said, Demeth hath forsaken me loving this present world. Disobeying God will start, God willing, Sunday on a, and it'll be beneficial to us. Uh, we'll do the book of Jonah, but one of the points in the book of Jonah is how disobedient a Christian can become. Not just, an, 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 and I'm, not, I'm using that in our language, but how a prophet could be. Jonah got, became very disobedient unto the Lord. But if you study the time frame and the kings that were behind him, which it seems was about 800 years before Christ, and Joel was prophesying, and so was a couple others during that time, um, the whole nation was backslidden. And because the nation of Israel was not doing their job unto another group of people as God's people, that is to the world as a witness, God called Jonah to go and save a bunch of pagan people. And there was a great revival at Nineveh. But we know that Jonah backslid there. And he didn't want to go God's way. He wanted to go another way. And God intervened, as he does always. As he does always. It's a very, very, very real, very real subject. Now, because it's a very real life we live. The work we're engaged in is very real. This is not a make-believe thing that we're doing. 
We're not make-believe Christians. We're not practicing something out of a coloring book. I mean, we're, we're living and walking with a holy God. We're, we're trusting one who keeps it all together. And we live unto him. We don't live unto ourselves. And, and there's a challenge there for each of us on an individual way from time to time. Now, the word moved, that is found in the book of Psalms. If we want to go back there, the word is a powerful word, and it means to waver. We have a lot of wavering today, and I, I do not say that with the sense that we're a solid anchor. We want to be a solid anchor, and the reason we want to be a solid anchor is because we see so much wavering, and we don't want to be like that. So we live in a world where there's a lot of wavering today on the things of God. Wavering in biblical doctrine. Wavering on where salvation is. Well, these things ought not to be. Wavering on believer's baptism. Wavering on the structure of a local New Testament church. Wavering on um, issues of separation. There's a lot of wavering today, and, and there ought not to be. And the word moved here does mean that. At first definition, it means waver. Waver, it means to slip, and it means to shake, and it means to fall. So there's a slip, a shake, then a fall. It also means to be carried out of course. Now, Paul the Apostle, before he died, said that he had fought a good fight, and he had kept his course. But to be moved means you are moved out of your course, or out of the perfect will of God, and you spend your life living not for him and his honor and his glory, but you spend your life for self. And Paul said, I didn't do that. I have finished my course. And the word move means uh, carried out of course. Carried out of course. Not walking, carried out. And this is the strict sense of the word if you'd want to check, check it out. It means to be fallen in decay. It means, let's just think of like, like another thought here. It means... To slide. I would suppose it means to take from the new nature's blessings back to the old nature's curses. And I'm approaching this from a New Testament standpoint. Now, access to important people is pretty significant. I mean, if, if the president was somewhere here in the community, uh, I don't think you'd be able to walk up to him, and you might be able to, but I don't think you'd be able to walk up to him and, and get his autograph, or, or, or maybe you want to punch him. I don't know. I hope you don't want to do that. <laughs> maybe you got an earful to tell him. I don't know. what. But I'm just saying, to get near him, you're not going to do that easy. Now, what we've seen here just a few weeks ago is ridiculous, but that's a whole other thought. But I'm just saying, to get to important people, it's not easy. And, but yet, when it comes to the God who created us, we are told in Hebrews chapter 4 to come boldly into the throne of grace. To come boldly. And of course, we come there by the shed blood of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Now, securing fellowship with the Lord is most important in your life. If you're a husband, securing that fellowship, listen, don't let no one mess with it. The most important thing for you men in your life is your fellowship with God Almighty, first and foremost. Not your wife, not your children. That is secondary, but they are not number one. Because if he's not number one and you make them number one, you will be not what you ought to be and they won't be what they ought to be. And wives, it goes the same way for you as well. And this is why the scripture sometimes says a man's worst foes are they of his own household. They who live in the same house with him or her. Securing your fellowship with the Lord is most important. Because you know what? I may be there for you from time to time. You may be there for me from time to time. But I'm not always going to be there for you. And you're not always going to be there for me either. There's going to be times in your life you're going to be alone. And no one's going to be there for you. Except the Lord. Except the Lord. And to have that fellowship with him at all times, again, it's exclusive, it's a wonderful divine blessing, and it's most important. 
Now, first of all, to secure fellowship with God, and we're looking at this not from the standpoint of being saved, of what you've got to do to be saved. David was a saved man. I'm not talking about a lost man here. If you go over to the book of Romans, he is very clear. David is, and is, even in his Psalms, blessed is the man unto whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. David is a saved man. Okay? So we're not coming at this as a work salvation because there's no way that can happen. We're, we're not looking at tonight what you need to do to be saved because there's nothing you can do to be saved but repent and trust. And it wasn't no different for him than it is me. He had to look forward. I got to look back. Some looked at him. I trust the Holy Scripture. And the first thing we find here is he says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? To, to secure your fellowship with God and to stay still with God, you, you need to constantly seek the Lord. You need to seek him. Sometimes people got this idea that once they get saved, everything is right, which if they're true, if they're born again, God does make things right. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. But, and, and that is salvation, that is justification, that is redemption, that is name recorded in the Lamb's book of life. That is all of that. But it's the starting point, not for salvation, but it's the starting point for a holy, sanctified life. It's the starting point. And again, David, David wasn't allowed behind that holy curtain. The priests were, he wasn't. He was limited to certain places in that tabernacle. I suppose he could step back and look, and I think he did here. Thinking about them holy men of the lineage of Moses, who went in there and did service unto the Lord, no one else could do, no one else could do. And he marveled about that thought, about the gift of the goodness of the Lord that had been given to him. So abiding in his tabernacle or dwelling in his holy hill, he must be sought out. And the tabernacle would be where the Ark of the Covenant was, where the cherubims were, where the mercy seat was. Where the, and of course, and you got other things that are in the tabernacle there. But a holy hill, a place that was dedicated for corporate Israel, for corporate worship. Burning sacrifices in the morning, burning sacrifices in the evening, every day, some days more, some events more, some, um, some um, um, festivals more. But there was a constant reminder there that you need to seek the Lord. I don't think you could be anywhere in Israel without seeing smoke. And I definitely know that the center of, of, of Israel, Jerusalem, the center of that was, the, was, was God's people and the the tabernacle. And, and it meant so much for the people. It meant their redemption. It meant their safety. It meant their wisdom. It meant their knowledge. It meant their welfare. It meant everything to them. Everything to them. Now, Old Testament. Now, in the New Testament, we do know that there is a little bit of an application parallel here because he does use the word, who shall abide in thy tabernacle, or who shall dwell in thy holy hill, well, as a New Testament church, we're not here in the Spirit of God. is not so much here in the church building unless we're here because He lives in us. And we're the tabernacle. And of course, you'll recall ever so clearly, ever so clearly, that in John chapter 14, Jesus said that He was going to leave. And that He would leave, that He would send a comforter, and he says, and I will pray to Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now listen, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. Now watch, for he dwelleth with you, and that's how it was in David's day. Dwelleth with, the Spirit of God would come upon them and, and leave, and dwell with them, and leave, and dwell with them, and leave. And he mentions that here, and that was no doubt the case at this particular time in history. But he goes on and says, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now, in you is the day of Pentecost. That's when the Holy Spirit of God came and seals us until the day of redemption. And there is no Spirit of God coming in our life, leaving, coming in our life, leaving. When we call upon the name of the Lord, he comes in. And he does not leave, and we're sealed until the day of redemption. 
And we don't go to a certain place and we don't look to a certain man to do certain things for us. We have come to a certain place. That's the foot of the cross. We've looked to the man, our high priest, Jesus Christ, who is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And he has taken his blood and placed it upon our brow. And by doing such, the spirit of the living God has entered into our lives. Think about that. He's with me everywhere I go. This is what gives me the admission into God's presence, the Holy Spirit of God. And seek the Lord and to get access to God in the sense of, of who He is. We, we seek His Word. We can't do this on our own way. We can't think of our own, our own ideas and our own theology and doctrine to seek Him. We're going to seek the one and only true God We've got to seek Him the one and only way, which is through His inspired, preserved, inerrant Word. It's the only way. It's the only way. There is no other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus also said, for there is one mediator between God and men, and that was Him. Paul said that. The man Christ Jesus. So I need to seek the Lord. And the more, you know what I've learned? The more that I seek the Lord the more I find of his fullness, and the more I find of his fullness, the more my fellowship grows and enriches. Seek the Lord. There's a lot of things in this world people are seeking today. And I understand that, but we need to seek the Lord. So, securing fellowship with God starts with, well, he says, you draw near to me, and I'll draw near to you. And, and of course, James has got some other thoughts here about some things that were in their life that they need to cleanse. But, but again, what is in view here in the Psalms? It's, it's fellowship. It's fellowship. It's not salvation. It's fellowship. Fellowship. Dwelling with the Lord. Let me say another thing that the psalmist says here. <clears throat> Seeking the Lord who shall abide in thy tabernacle. That's where you'll find him at. Who shall dwell on thy holy hill? That's where you'll find him at. And that's the idea that David is representing there. Seek him. And of course, that's found throughout the, New, the Old Testament. Um, and we know in the New Testament, he's come seeking and he's still seeking. But let me say a second thing here about securing godly fellowship. And that is this. And, and this isn't hard, ladies and gentlemen. And that is live a righteous life. Live a righteous life. Live righteous Live righteous. Now, if we're going to live righteous, we've got to know the way of righteousness, which again is revealed through God's Word. But the psalmist mentions it. And by the way, if you study out what the psalmist is saying here, and you go back and parallel 2 Peter chapter 1 about them virtues and, and, and temperance and stuff, you'll find that them things that Peter is talking about are necessary for what the psalmist is talking about. And again, that word fall and move, they parallel each other. Now, first of all, he says here, he that walketh uprightly. Let me say something about my walk and your walk. Regardless of who it is, let me just say something about walk. A walk. Walk talks. You can talk all you want. But your walk talks. But you, and sometimes our talk doesn't match our walk. But our walk, our walk with the Lord really re reveals who we are, not our talk. Our walk, our walk. And I'm just saying, as I think the psalmist is saying, we need to, I need to understand something about my walk. My walk talks. My walk speaks. How I handle myself, present myself, where I hang out at, who I hang out with, what I company with speaks to other people about my character. I need to understand. We need to understand that your walk talks. Now, he says, He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. First of all, Living a right life, ladies and gentlemen, it starts with a pure condition, consecrated heart. Not the mouth, not the 
not the external. It starts with the heart. This is why God was so encouraged in his servant David, because David was a man, he was a man, but he was a man after God's own heart. That was the difference between David and Saul too, by the way, of why David could be forgiven something and Saul, it seems, couldn't be. There's a heart difference. There's a heart difference. David meant when he did wrong, he meant his repentance. Saul never took it to view that way. Now, speak it the truth in his heart. I don't think that's as easy as we think because the heart is evil and desperately wicked, untamable. Who can know it? But I know a few things about the heart according to the Bible. Uh, the Word of God reveals to, to me much about the heart. The heart is deceitful above all things. Well, I think maybe that's deceitful. And somebody would say, well, no, that, that's deceitful. And somebody says, no, 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 no. This is deceitful. And somebody need to say, no, you're all wrong. Your heart's most deceitful. And it is. That's the kind of heart we got. That's why we need to have our heart conditioned and consecrated to Christ. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? As much as I want to know my heart of 53 years pounding in my chest, I don't know my heart. And you don't either. I know its capabilities, but I don't know its full capabilities. And you don't either. Full capabilities. Now, as we think about this, I think we understand the truth of this throughout Scripture. You know, the Bible says in reference to, well, it was in reference to Saul and his, his disobedience and David being anointed. And you know the story, 1 Samuel 16, 7. <clears throat> Elab, uh, excuse me, Eliab walked in before Samuel. And Samuel said in his heart, surely this is the Lord's anointed. And the Holy Spirit of God spake to Samuel and said unto him, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for the Lord looketh, for, the man, for man looketh, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. The heart. The heart. First Samuel chapter 16. If we think about First Chronicles chapter number 29, let me quote to you verse 17 there about the heart. A servant's heart. First Chronicles chapter 29 verse 17, I quote, I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and has pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in my, excuse me, as for me, in the uprightness of mine heart, I have willingly offered all these things, and now have I seen with joy thy people, which are present here, to offer willingly unto thee. And this is David, this is David. This is David. David understood this. And obviously, that's why he's writing what he wrote. Remember what David said again in another psalm? <clears throat> <clears throat> concerning the heart. In Psalms 51, he said in verse number six, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part. Thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden parts. The heart. It's the heart. When you live a righteous life, we'll start with Understanding our walk and understanding that our walk starts with a pure, consecrated heart. A heart that's after God. And I would suppose and suggest to each of us it's a heart that's conditioned by the, by the Word of God. Because John chapter 17, verse 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And sanctification is our holiness, our setting aside, our consecratedness. It comes by spending time in the Word. Now I'm going to say something about this. I understand that there's a lot of different mediums for the Word today. I get that. But I'm not talking about just flipping something on and letting Alexander Scorby talk to you. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that either because faith cometh by hearing and hearing the Word of God. 
But I'm talking about the Word of God speaking to you. Speaking to you. Anybody can get into a habit of popping in a CD or listening to something and in another day they don't even know what they listen to. They don't even know what they've listened to. They don't even know what they've learned. And, and once again, I'm not criticizing that because we thank God what's being listened to. But I'm just saying the Word of God needs to speak to our hearts. It needs to condition our heart. A cluttered heart. A cluttered heart is not an organized heart. And proper principle. And a heart that is cluttered with the world that is not organized does not have time for Christ to set on its throne. And only the Word of God can weave out what's wrong and, and what's right and decipher in your mind by its truth what's wrong and what's right in your heart and organize your heart. So we need to watch our heart. Guard it. We need to guard it. Young people need to guard their heart. Young people ought to be careful what they're listening to, who they're hanging out with, what kind of influence they got. They, not, not, they don't know how to guard their heart. They're, they're like a simple one, the Bible says. They're a simple one. What is a simple one? A simple one will follow anybody, believe anything. And we have a responsibility to tell them the biblical principles of God's Word and try to encourage them with something that will make for an inward character. Look at another thing he says here. <clears throat> Living a righteous life <clears throat> starts with a pure, consecrated heart. Secondly, he that backbiteth not with his tongue well, our time is getting away from us. I th we can finish up. He that backbiteth not with his tongue. Let me just say this. Don't, don't gossip and slander people. Don't do that. Don't do that. You don't gossip about nobody, friend. That's evil. I tell you what he says will happen. If you do do it, you might expect sooner or later, we would expect you'll be moved. You will be moved. See, the promise that he's given here is kind of conditional. So we want to murmur or complain and gossip and slander people. Don't think that's not going to make you slide, friend. Don't think that that's not going to shake you. It, it has that tendency. Don't gossip or slander people. Verse number three. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor. Let me say number, uh, number three. Number, uh, yeah, number three. Treat your neighbor proper. You said, I don't like them. This is not the question. This is not the question. Okay, I get it. <clears throat> the priest didn't like the, 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 the man on the roadside. The Levites, I understand it, but the Samaritan did. And I'm just saying we need to love our neighbor because the Bible teaches that very clearly. Uh, to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that will deal with five of the commandments. And love your neighbor as yourself. And on these hang all the law and all the prophets. And there's no doubt there's truth in that. I would say more people have gotten backslidden and gotten away from God because they've got a circle together and they've slandered about people and they've gossiped about people and they didn't even realize a year later why they got so messed up. And probably still to this day don't even realize it. Why they got so messed up. If he says something like this, we got to take him for what he says. That is God's spirit. Treat your neighbor proper. Okay, love your neighbor. He says in verse number four, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned. Contemned. And here, here's a thought. Despised, that's what this word contempt here means. Despised and rejects sinful activity and behavior. He said, no, I'm not going to do that. That's not what I'm going to be involved in. I'm not going near that. I'm not, and, and I just say this. <clears throat> For he that knoweth to do right and doeth it not, ladies and gentlemen, it's what? It's that simple. I, we can push it out and explain it away all we want. But if the Bible says something's to be done and we say we're not going to do it, what is it? It's sin. It's sin. It's that simple. And so we need to be wise about not rejecting sinful activities. We need to reject them. We need to realize what the Bible says it says for our learning and our admonition and our, and our welfare. He says that we should honor those that fear God. It's found in verse number four. In whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he, that, <clears throat> but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. And I, I, I do believe that. I believe that honor, ought, just like Paul says, honor ought to be given where honor is due. 
and we need to <clears throat> honor people that fear God. And we're living in a culture today, as we learned Sunday, this past Sunday night, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, despisers, lovers of pleasure, heady, traitors, high-minded. We're living in a day-to-day where people don't respect and honor people who fear God and try to live right. That's the day we're living in. And by the way, that is part of the gigantic problem we have as a breakdown with a cultured people. They'll never catch on. I hope some do. Most won't. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope so. But we need to honor those that fear the Lord. Verse number four. Again, he says, He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. What's he saying here? He's saying, keep your word. Keep your word. If I keep my word, it's going to hurt me. Do you suffer the hurt? Keep your word. And we've seen in the Old Testament, some men say some vows to the Lord. And things have happened and they've had to do some things that were bad. That we wonder, how would a man take his daughter and let her go up for so many days, bewailing her virginity and take her life? Uh, he, he, he gave his word to the Lord about doing something. And he said, I can't go back on my word. So we would say, what's well, your daughter there? And he'd say, but he's God there. And I told God I would do this. And so I don't want to get into that, but keep your word even to your own hurt. So let me just say this. Keep what God tells you to do. Stay focused on that and do what you know you've got to do. You say, well, I tell you what, you'll be the only one around you. But that's how you're going to be. That's, well, you're going to hurt yourself, then that's how it goes, ladies and gentlemen. That's how it is. Now watch. Now we're already, we're, we're talking about something here. So that's negative sounding, but keep in mind we're talking about securing fellowship. Okay? He says in verse number five, I'm hastening, he that putteth not out his money to usury. So he is saying, if you want to help somebody out financially and they want to pay you back, that's fine. But don't charge them 2%. Don't charge them 4%. Don't you? That's a, and by the way, that percentage principle is from the Bible. When they were late on their tie, they were to add a fifth part to that. Uh, of the, so we're not going to get into that. But it's got the idea, what do you need, 20? Oh, I'll loan you 20 if you'll give me 10 on top of it. How desperate are you? No, we, let me just say this. When something like this, um, uh, lending money with interest. We ought not to do that. And he goes on and says, nor taketh the reward against the innocent. That means this. You don't take bribes for people over people. You don't get people to side up with you to go over people. God's people are not for sale. That's how that works. We don't get people to chip in on something that we may think needs an encouragement to overshadow or over hurt somebody. We don't, we don't take bribes. We don't do that. We're not for sale. We're not for sale. Now watch. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Now here's my last thought. Number one, seek the Lord. Number two, do right. Number three, accept the promise. Here's the promise. This is a promise. It's conditional. This is conditional. And again, if you take this over into the New Testament and you study 2 Peter chapter 1, you'll find that I'm doing no harm to this particular text, although it's Old Testament. The word fail or fall, fall there. Fail, I think, is mentioned as well. But accept God's promises. Because he says in verse 5, He that doeth these things, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. So he that doeth these things, the psalmist is saying, he is saying, well, they're not going to waver. They're not going to slip. They're not going to shake. They're not going to fall. They're not going to be carried out of course. They're not going to be fallen to decay. They're not going to slide. They're not going to be taken from the very blessings of a holy God back to the gutter to where there's curse at. And that's how that is. And that's pretty simple, isn't it? It's pretty simple. It's conditional. Again, the most important thing in your life is your fellowship with God. Trust me on that. The most important thing in your life is your fellowship with a holy God. Because he's the one who can do what nobody else can do. Now, thank God we got a lot of good people around us that we fellowship with that are like-minded. Iron sharpeneth iron, that's good. But I'm just saying we want to stand still with God. Where we're at today, we want to be two years from now, but we want to be more mature. We want that fellowship to be greater and greater and greater and greater. We want that, our fellowship to be as such as a, a, a speak, a, your servant heard of. 
I didn't call for you, young man. Go back to bed. Samuel, Samuel. And he comes in and says, uh, I'm here. Did you need something? He says, I never called for you. Go back to bed. And the Lord called him, Samuel, Samuel. And he came back in and he says, you spake. And he says, no, I didn't. But next time you hear that, you say, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And that man matured from that to being one of the greatest prophets this world has ever known. One of the greatest prophets, Samuel, this world has ever known. And what God did with him, not in the sense of an office of a prophet as he had, you're probably more privileged because the Spirit of God has sealed you to the day of redemption. But what God has done with him and matured him is the same thing that God wants to do with you and mature you. Fellowship. Fellowship with the Lord is wonderful. I, that, that writer who wrote um, his eyes on a sparrow and I know he watches me, there's something about that hymn that we like, isn't it? Isn't it? Fellowship. Securing your fellowship. Well, I, I love the church. And I love the family, my family, and I love the church. And I love the fellowship. I do. But in order for my fellowship to get greater there, our fellowship to get greater there, our fellowship has got to be greater with God on an individual level. The greater our fellowship is with God on an individual level, the more our fellowship, the sweeter our fellowship is going to be one with another. If we don't take heed to something like this and someone starts to slide, we get to that place where we're at Kroger shopping and we pop around the corner and there they are and they look at you like you're their enemy and they run the other way. That's the opposite of this effect. We ought not to be getting in that. Are you following me? Yeah. Okay. Well, great fellow, the greatest fellowship of all that's ever needed with God must be attained through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because nobody can come to God without coming to Christ. If we want a fellowship with our Creator, we've got to come to Jesus. And we've got to acknowledge His death, His burial, His resurrection. We got to acknowledge his sacrifice, his substitutionary death on the cross. That God, out of his love for us, sent Christ to die for us so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be made like Christ, so we can have fellowship with God. Oh, God loves you. God's not willing that any should perish. None. It starts with the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Trusting in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and recognizing that we have did the opposite of that which would please God. We have violated his law. And the only way that violation can be made right is by the precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are grateful and we are thankful for the fellowship that you give us. We have no God like, there is no God like unto you. You're always there for us. You never leave us. You never forsake us. You are a present help in the time of need. You are a loving God, a kind God, a gracious God, an all-powerful God, an all-knowing God, and an ever-present God. There is nothing too hard for you. You're always working things out for the good. And we surely would like to thank you for sending Jesus to break down that middle wall of partition that says, come on in. Come on in. And Father, we thank you tonight for who you are and who, who you reflect yourself to be through your word. You are God alone and there is no equal. And we thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit of God. We thank you for drawing us and showing us and convicting us. And I pray that you'll just encourage our fellowship with the thought tonight. He that doeth these things shall not be moved. No one here wants to be moved. We want to grow. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.